Hi, Lisa. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, we're, as we're doing this, can, um, can you just make sure that we're admitting everybody that's signing in? Of course. Did you see, you can see my screen? We're good? Yeah, we're good. Okay, cool. So you should click off at 16. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this one? Yeah. Not in. And excuse me, and how are we signing in? Um. This is Davina. Go ahead and sign in there. We don't ask for your name. Um, your email automatically pops up uh, when you sign in. Okay. Your, your name pops up. The only thing that we ask you is these AAP5 polls right here. It's just your gender, your age range, um, your race, and then what county and chapter you're looking, you're, you're joining us from. That's all the information that we ask for. And do I put that in the email? Oh, no. Um, if when you, you should have it pop up right now inside your poll oh, okay. on Zoom. Okay, I see it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> we're we're trying to have we're trying to go live on Navajo Nation Library's um Facebook page right now, but we're having some technical difficulties again. So did anybody have any questions about anything we discussed last week before we start? Okay, time is six o'clock p.m. Let's go ahead and get this show on the road. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. It's Anna. Nice to see you guys. Those of you guys that are um, joining us again, uh, especially those um, that came here for the first part. Remember that uh, those of you that show up for three classes or more um, get to get the the book the whole book and you can pick that at the Nav pick that up at the Navajo Nation library um so that that's all dependent on your on your presence in class um for the next six classes today we have Mr. Donovan yes, Donovan Pete Donovan Pete from Navajo Nation library Hello, everybody <laughs> and he's trying to get the the set the page set up for um Facebook Live, and then we also have Alma. Hello, everybody. She's going to be a technical um, And then joining us from remote from St. John's office, uh, the cooperative extension out of St. John's is Lisa Reedhead. Lisa, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I am Lisa. I'm actually uh, sit in our Pine Top office. So I'm glad to be here with you guys tonight and um, excited to see what's going to happen. I did want to let you know, Anna, I did get the chat up. So I'm good on there. I can see the chat so I can kind of monitor that for you, too. All right. Thank you so much. So Lisa is going to be um, our technical assistant um, remotely. So she'll be doing all of the page clicking today. Um, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and put it in the chat or feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask that question. Um, raise your hand and Lisa will be there to um, check to see who has questions. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties or anything like that, um, put them in the chat and we'll try to help you out as, as much as we can um, as we're starting. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide.
So today, so today we're going to be talking about getting started with our healthy soil. I know we had a lot of questions about healthy soil, getting started. Um, we're going to be on pages 33 to about 55 in your um, seed to supper manuals. I'm not too sure if some of you guys have tried to go ahead and go forward and read ahead of the rest of the class. But today we're gonna to be talking a lot about building your soil, composting, fertilizing, making your garden beds, um, and then also just maintaining that soil throughout the summer um, and throughout your gardening period. Like I said, right now is a good time for you guys to get started on your gardens. Um, people are putting their gardens to rest right now because it's getting cold, it's starting to frost over, um, your plants are starting to freeze. Um, and then also the leaves on the trees are starting to yellow and they'll be on the ground here pretty soon. So it's a good time to start picking up your composting material right now and you'll have an abundance of that ready to go for springtime if you start now. Next slide, please. Okay, so first building our healthy soil. Uh, next slide. So soil, good soil is something that we call tilth, right? So tilth is is um, what your soil is is health, your healthy soil. So we're talking about good soil tilth. Um, that would be the the terminology that we use when we're talking about soil tilth. Um, you can support your it, it's 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 a soil that can support plant life. Um, when you're picking up your soil, it should feel loamy it should be easy to dig it shouldn't be hard it soaks up water it stores water in it and it drains well and it makes a good seed bed so if you ever go into um the the stores and you try to um, pick out a good um, soil you can reach in um, feel it when it's dry feel it when it's wet um, you're trying to make your soil into that. And there's a, a million ways you can amend your soils to make sure that you're getting to where it needs to be. And it's got all the nutrients, vitamins, minerals, and water retention you need so that you can garden. So when we're talking about loamy texture, we're talking about um, when you take your soil and you roll it into a ball, it holds its shape when it's moist. But when you squeeze it, it'll easily crumble. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about loamy soil. And then loyal, loamy soil, it holds a lot of moisture, it drains well, and it gives the plants, um, uh, the roots of the plants, uh, air and, and the water that it needs. So it has that, it has that wiggle room for, for your roots to develop and grow outwards and under. Um, whereas if it wasn't loamy and it was say like a clay, your roots wouldn't be able to move freely um, and grow outwards. Next slide. Real quick, Anna, I just had a question. Um, first, actually a participant had a question. On the registering to join the meeting, it just says, I just had a quick question about joining the meeting. For the past two classes, I had to register to join the meeting. Is this something we have to do every time? No, you should only have to register once and then it's the same um, meeting ID and the same password all the way through. Um, you shouldn't have to do anything. When I, when I send out my reminders, it'll be, just a reminder, it's the same exact um, meeting information on it. Um, so when I sent out an email yesterday to you, that was just a reminder. It still had all the same information on it. You didn't have to register again. Um, right now, there are 78 of you that are registered for the class and all everybody received that email. Um, and then when you sign in, uh, somebody usually has to go in and approve as you're coming in to make sure that, uh, so you'll be in a waiting room before you get in. Any other questions, Lisa? Did that, was, did that answer their question? Um, I will ask her to message me. I, I'm not sure, but yeah, no, nothing right now. You're good. Okay. All right. So you, symptoms of poor soil. Um, 
there's a lot of problems with their soil out here in this area, especially in Arizona. Um, it's not like soil that we have that people have back east. So um, problems with our soil is something that we're going to run into, and it's something that you're going to start to get really good at noticing. Um, so problems in your in the home garden have nothing to do sometimes with disease or insects. Um, a lot of times it's caused by our poor, our poor soil and what we have here on the res um, on the res or within the four corners. Um, so symptoms of poor soil include dry cracked soil, soil that's too hard to dig, um, and soil that doesn't absorb any water. So you're going to notice that a lot of the soil that we have here, um, it's, it, it meets all that criteria. So um, those of you living on rocky areas, this is when you want to think how, how do you want to garden? Um, making sure that your garden's within walking distance. If your soil is not good and it's meeting all these um, poor soil criteria, maybe you want to make a, a raised bed, maybe you want to do um, some um, container gardenings, maybe you want to think about may possibly amending the soil as much as possible, um, but we're going to go forward from here. We're going to talk a lot about amending your soils now um, and, and seeing what's more feasible for you and for your budget, okay? Next slide. So you're gonna find this picture on page 39. Um, and it, your garden soil is made up of air, water, organic matter, tiny pieces of broken rock, uh, and garden soils are roughly about half of it is about pore space. Um, that's empty pore space that's in between the dirt and the rock and the organic matter. Um, and water fills inside those small pores in between. And then air fills the large pores. Um, and you can kind of see it going off of the diagram on page 39. So if the broken rock is mostly sand, soil pores hold a lot of air and not enough water. And if the broken rock is mostly clay, soil pores hold a lot of wear, water and not much air. So if it's sand, more air. If it's clay, more water. Okay. So when you're when you put down a layer of clay, you see all the water it kind of it absorbs so much, and then it doesn't permeate through the clay very well, right? But with sand, when you pour water on the sand, it absorbs it quickly and it goes to the bottom, right? So if you're thinking sand, you should be thinking air. If you're thinking clay, you should be thinking water, okay? Um, but plants and the roots need both air and water to grow. The, the trick is finding that halfway point um, between having the sand and, and the clay. And we're gonna be dealing with a lot of different types of clay out here on the res in the four corners. So here we find a diagram of organic matter. So as you can see, organic matter only makes up a small part of your healthy soil, but it's essential in a, in a vegetable garden because that's where all your a lot of your nutrients come from. And organic matter is anything that was once living and is now decomposed or broken down into the soil. Um, can I get some examples of organic matter that you can put into your soil um, to get that small portion? You can put it in the chat or you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Leaves, Victoria, Clara, bananas. Yes, bananas have potassium in them and we're gonna go over um, your, your different nutrients here pretty soon. Apples, yes. Grass clippings, yes. Okay, so you can use paper, newspaper, shredded paper. Those are all made out of trees. Um, and those are also 
uh, organic matter too as well. If you have a, an office that does paper shredding, those that makes really good compost, um, and you can use them in raised bed to raised beds too as well. Veggie scraps, yes, you can use veggie scraps. Those have a lot of nutrients in them. They do break down well in the in the soil. Eggshells are really good too as well. They have calcium in it that that your soil does need. Um, other things you can think about are also wood ash. Um, straw. Uh, I would kind of think about coffee grinds a second time. You know, coffee grinds is something that they would use back east because they have a lot of slugs and stuff. And so coffee grinds help to keep those slugs away out here with the soils that we have. When we're amending our soils, we have these coffee grinds. They can, um, they can actually be a little bit more harmful than helpful. Um, that's just according to what I, I read about my coffee grounds because I drink a lot of coffee. Um, and I noticed that when I put it into my garden, um, sometimes it, it's kind of, um, it gives my, my plants too much of a boost sometimes. Um, so kind of do your research on coffee grounds and, and what it can do to your soils, okay? And if it's gonna benefit you or not. Um, a little bit of wood ash, yes. From your stove, from your home stove, yes, you can use wood ash. But use very little of it, not too much. Um, make sure that what you're putting into your garden bed isn't um, a fire that once had plastic in it or, or um, anything chemical in it on, on, the, on the wood. So wood ash is good, yes. Um, all good examples. So you guys are all on the right track here. Um, so this is all stuff that you can start thinking about using in your compost pile. Um, other things are the bebechan, sinpechan, um, um, begashibechan, but I really um, want to promote the use of, uh, if you're going to use fertilizers, natural fertilizers that you can find around the home or within within your home area to use um, fertilizers that come from animals that have at least four stomachs. Um, when you have animal, when you're using um, when you're using the fertilizer from a four stomach animal, um, the four stomach animal actually um, cleans out a lot of the seed and the straw and breaks it down a lot more so that you're not getting a lot of that uh, weeds growing through. Um, so cow manure, sheep manure, rabbits, those I would uh, really um, promote and chickens too as well, those four. Um, horse, not too much. So be careful with which, which fertilizers you wanna use. Uh, next slide. So um, organic matter, uh, in nature, uh, your soil microorganisms and earthworms, they start to decompose. They decompose raw organic materials like fallen plant trimmings, food scraps, until they can't be broken down anymore. Uh, you can add the, the, the decomposed material to your gar garden beds as compost. Um, planting and raw organic material can really harm your plants. So it's, it, you have to decompose it before you use it in your garden, okay? If you're using um, fertilizers, make sure that you're oh, using fertilizers um, straight from, from the corrals that are and at least 120 days old or older, okay? You wanna make sure that you're not gonna burn your plants. When you're putting in fresh manure into your garden beds, you can burn your 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 plants, and um, your pH level is going to go up because it, there's a lot of um, uric acid still in it. So be careful with that. Um, and then you can do cold composting by adding the, you know the raw compost into the top of your gardens in the winter time, and that'll help to break it down throughout the winter. And come springtime, you can mix it in real nice and good. Um, but then you're, by the time you're starting to plant your organic material that you put in there, your vegetable scraps, your, your eggshells, those had like well over three months to, to, um, to decompose and, and become, in, become um, compost. So uh, don't put like fresh, uh, fresh tomatoes in your garden while, 
while you're ready to, <laughs> while you're trying to compost. You can't compost while you're growing at the same time. It needs time to break down. So it can harm your garden. All right, so you wanna consider testing your soil when you're starting a new garden. Um, a soil test can measure your soil's pH and the amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK, okay? When you're starting your garden the first year, maybe say like right about now might be a good time for you to do your soil testing. I don't really like to do soil testing because it really gets into the nitty gritty and the science of it all. And it kind of discourages me from, so, from gardening altogether. So I'm always just like winging it all the time. Um, but testing your pH um, tells you how acid or alkaline um, your nutrients, your soil is. Um, so acid or alkaline, um, your vegetable gardens are, are most productive when the soil is slightly acidic between 6.0 and 7.0. If your soil pH is lower than 6.0, it's too acidic, and then some nutrients are going to be less available to your plants. Um, you can raise your pH by adding your agricultural lime, which also adds calcium to the soil. Um, and when you're doing this, you want to apply about five pounds per 100 square feet of growing area or more if your pH is really low, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so on page 42, you're going to be able to find a little tiny chart there on what to put in your compost pile. And then on page 42 at the bottom, you're going to find a, a table there on how much compost do you need in order to add a two-inch two layer to your garden space. Okay, so go ahead and use those charts. Um, this coming fall to kind of just calculate what you what you might need. If you're gonna go the expensive route and you're gonna go to Home Depot to get these amendments, um, this would, I would recommend using this chart. Um, testing your soils, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. If you're, a, if you're applying a balanced fertilizer for several years, your soil, your soil may already have enough phosphorus and potassium and it might need more nitrogen because nitrogen leaches out of the soil really quickly, um, especially when you're watering all the time or during heavy rainfall. So you might want to, to test your soil every three to five years if you really need to supply any nutrient other than nitrogen. Okay, so nitrogen um, you can get out of fertilizers. Okay, um, you, can, you can go ahead and do a little bit of of research on your fertilizers um, or call your call me or call your local master gardener if you have any questions. Like I said, we could probably be doing a soil testing um, here in our office pretty soon. I'll, I'll email you guys if I have that event coming up. Any questions so far on soil testing? None in the chat so far. Okay, next slide. So soil for your container gardens. Um, potting soil is essential for container gardens. You can't use garden soil. You can't use amending soil on this. It has to be potting soil, okay? There is potting soil for vegetables and there is potting soil for flowers. So, you know, it's really up to you guys what kind of potting soil you want to use. If you want to fruit vegetables, you're going to want to get the, the vegetable potting soil because those have a nice balanced um, nutrients um, um, worked into the soil and it's been tested before it goes out into the market. And your soil has to be refreshed or it has to be replaced every year. That's when container gardening starts to really get uh, really expensive because you're gonna be wanting to um, refresh those soils every year. Um, and then 
you're going to want to start thinking about getting fertilizer. A, a good balanced fertilizer is probably best for your container gardenings. So when we're talking fertilizers, we're talking um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And when you're buying your fertilizer, you're going to see the three numbers at the top. And sometimes they're 15, 15, 15, 10, 10, 10, or they'll come in different um, increments like 15, 5, and 10. But it always goes in the same order, NPP. NPH, NPK, sorry, NPK. Um, so nitrogen would be the first uh, would be the first number. Phosphorus would be the second number, and potassium would be the third number. So um, when you're looking at your when you're looking at your your fertilizers, you'll see that on the bag. So um, let's see. Garden soils are will not drain well in your pot. Um, so no potting, no garden soil in your pots. Use potting soil. Next slide. So now we're going to go into preparing your so soil. Next slide. So now that we've talked about developing your garden site, planning your garden all through um, lesson one, it's time to start talking about your planting. And in the spring, it always begins with your soil, your soil type um, and, you know, time, making sure it's not, it's not going to frost over, um, making sure that you have your starts already done and they're ready to go into your soil. Okay, next. So there's going to be three simple steps to preparing your soil, okay? Um, first, don't rush. You're going to notice out here, it starts to warm up in about February sometimes, and you get these really nice warm days, and you're going to want to start thinking about planting come March. Um, don't rush, okay? Because in, our, in, in lesson one, we talked about freeze dates and checking our calendars for freeze dates. Does anybody remember uh, the time that I recommended for us to be growing out here um, uh, in the Four Corners area? We talked about it last class. Excuse, excuse me. I believe it was like late May, early June. Yes, late May, early June. So like the middle of May to the beginning of June, that's when we don't have any more frost. Um, remember, I was telling you the story about how people, they rush and they get their seeds and their, their corn seeds out into the cornfield in the beginning of March, the end of March. And then that, that late frost or that, or that snow comes in it, and then they lose their whole crop and they freeze before they even get to grow, right? So don't rush. Um, Wait until the moisture conditions are right in your soil, okay? Um, to test your soil moisture, you're gonna wanna take a handful of soil and squeeze it. If it stays in a mud ball and it sticks to your gardening tools or it looks shiny and it's too wet, it's not time to, it's not time to plant. If it's powdery and clumped, it's too dry. If it crumbles freely and feels like a wrung out sponge, it's just right, okay? We're talking about that loamy soil, right? Second, you're gonna wanna remove your overwintered materials, all right? If you haven't, if you haven't um, been gardening for a while and you haven't done a cover crop, you're, don't worry about this, but if you did cover, do a cover crop, you're gonna need to cut down your cover crop Remove it and turn it under. You want to make sure to do this before the cover crop has set the seeds, okay? And at least two to four weeks before planting, okay? So if you have a cover crop, whether it be a straw, hay, um, some sort of a wheat of some sort, make sure you're cutting those down before they get mature enough to seed. And make sure you do it two to four weeks before you start to plant, okay? If you've covered your beds with mulch that has not yet decomposed over the winter, you wanna take that mulch off 
and remove it before planting, okay? Davina, you said you use mulch, but you're gonna try other options. Um, mulch is just there to keep the, the, the weed cover down. Mulch, you can, you can overwinter it and have it start um, decomposing over the winter. Depending on which mulch you're getting, you could actually be harming your plants, okay? Especially if they're vegetable plants. Okay, and then third, you're gonna wanna add compost. You're gonna wanna spread two to four inches of compost evenly over the bed, all right? You're gonna wanna turn it with a shovel or push with the digging fork really deep into the soil and throughout the bed and work in the compost by wiggling the fork. And then to save time and energy, you can do your fertilizer along with your compost and mix them together. Um, we're going to start talking about fertilizer here in a little bit. Yeah. Next. Okay, here we go. Compost. And does anybody have any any questions on preparing your so soil for the spring so far? I have a question. Everything in your uh, Dewan, go ahead. So with like um, animal manure that's mixed with like hay. So my one of my grandmothers has a one ton, one ton bale of hay. Uh -huh. And like the debris that falls off of it, would that be good to add on top of the soil? Um, I wouldn't recommend using hay because you don't know if it's seeded out. You don't know what's actually in the hay. Um, we do have a problem here on the reservation with invasive weeds. So when you're buying these hays from elsewhere and you're putting that into your garden, you could have some different kinds of invasive weeds that you might have to battle come springtime. So yeah. you, you definitely want to make sure that if you're going to put something um, green down like that, that you do it to where it's deep, deep enough that it won't seed out. Um, so raised beds like lasagna gardening beds, the I would recommend you would put the hay at the bottom of that, okay? That way it doesn't get that sunlight, it doesn't get the warmth, it doesn't, and, and it has time to decompose before it starts to grow outwards. Um, because those seeds inside your hay can, can be there for up to seven, seven to 12 years before they seed out, before they die, okay? So mm -hmm. if you're gonna use hay, use it at the bottom of like your lasagna beds so that they have time to decompose. But even then those seeds can be, they can just lay dormant like that for years. Okay, and you were talking about invasive weeds. Would that include um, those little bullheads they're called tutnistae or tutnistae? I'm not sure if you know what it is this. I think yeah. the English translation is cocklebirds. Yeah, the cocklebirds, those are the big, uh, they're, let me see. Those are the big seeds that they're, they're like about this big, right? And they're really sticky at the top. Are those yeah, ones? Yeah, about thumb size. They're about this, like, yeah, the size of a thumb. Yeah, those are also invasive weeds too as well. So be careful with those. Once you see them, cut them down before they start to seed. If they start to, to take over your garden, make sure that you're not moving them around. Um, dig them up, burn them where they're at, okay? Um, burn them? Those, yeah, burn them. That's the only thing you can do to be able to get rid of them. Um, okay. if, you're, if you're taking them and you're moving them into a ditch and the water takes that, your entire place will be run, run over by cocklebirds. Because that's uh, exactly how it is where, I, where I'm from. Um, we have an old cornfield that's at least a football field by a football field. And... Just over time, nobody has been growing or gardening. So those invasive species just took over all of the land. And we yeah. do have like natural growing hay grown out, but the only thing is like, we got all those weeds, just um, ton of is growing everywhere. So yeah, I was, I was joking with my uncle about just burning the whole, and the that's whole probably land. The only thing you can do to control something like that because those seeds will they'll be there for seven to 12 years and they'll lay dormant so the next the next big um water season the next big uh, rain season they will grow out 
Um, okay. The only thing you can do to try to fight them is just pick them out, burn them, and plant really good cover crops. And cover crops, um, I would really try to recommend something that's like more native seed, seed to our areas. Um, so kind of keep a lookout and do your research on what kind of seeds you you can buy with that are that that can grow within your area. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, the they'll they'll go they'll they'll definitely take over a whole field. So if like if I were to do something like that on a large scale, do I have to call like the fire department or something to ask for, to let them know I'm be trying to do a control burning? Yes, you'll have to get a burn permit from um, Navajo Nation Forestry. Um, okay. Yeah, so you'll have to do that, and I'm I'm not too sure if they have a burn plan that they have that you have to go through to be able to do that. But yeah, you do need to let the Navajo Nation know, especially because we have all these uh, wildfires going on here on the. Yeah, red. that's what I was. Yeah, so what I was thinking, I mean, like I could cut lines and like try to start two fires to fight each other, like how they say in his firefighter movies, but I'm just one person, like well, yeah. I, I don't know, but hey, it might go out of control. I'll have nobody there to help me out. So yeah, yeah, you have to report anything you burn. You do need to get a burn permit, and you probably have to let your chapter house know that you're gonna be burning in that area so that uh um you know signs are posted that nobody needs to call like emergency response you know oh. sure. all right thank you dewan good question hi uh anna rita thank you so much for um this presentation and my apologies if i missed it but one of the things that i've been trying to look for um or if you have recommendations on someone to test the soil uh, around my house in um, Noslini because I have tried to plant several times and uh, nothing happens. Can you <laughs> recommend somebody or something uh, or a place I can buy a test? Yeah, you can actually buy your tests. Um, do you go to Gallup often? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, you, so you can buy a test. There's a nursery out there. Um, Holiday Nursery. They have the single test um, tubes for your soil test and you can mm -hmm. buy those. I'm not sure how much they cost out there, but you can take that with you or uh, you can wait until I do an event for soil testing and I'll announce it to you guys. You guys can come in and bring a bag of soil and, and you can test it yourself so that you can see the different soils. Um, and I, I can teach you how to do that. That's awesome. Okay, I will wait for that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yep. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anna Rita, there's a couple questions in the chat. Um, Rachel had a question. Was that her that just spoke? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I was reading my chat. <laughs> and then Noka did, said, I never did cover crops before. What would that be for a small raised bed? Um. Yeah, you can do cover crops in a small raised bed if you want to. Um, cover crops are more for like in ground gardens though. Um, that's just to keep the soil healthy in ground. When you're doing raised beds, uh, they do help out a lot as far as composting um, and you can cut them down, turn them under. But remember, you gotta wait two to four, two to four weeks before planting. Did that answer Noka's question? Noka, is that a good enough answer for you? Um, I think so. I, uh, this is our first year having a raised bed and actually growing stuff. So I don't know how to transition from like growing stuff into like preparing the ground for winter, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always use, um, you can always use, uh, what are those things called? Uh, mulch. You can use a mulch on the top throughout the winter mm -hmm. um, and, and just leave it that way. And that way you're keeping your, your costs down as far as cover crops and buying seed for cover crop. Okay. Okay. Yes. That works just as well. Very. Right. Thank you. All right. 
there was one more question just about burning, but I think you might have answered it. Um, when was the best time to burn? There's some weeds around the house that there's, she's scared to do that. So um, just is it best to do it when it's dry or green? But you kind of said when the water season was kind of coming around. Yeah, when the water season comes, when it's raining, that's probably the best time to burn. Once they're dry and once they're seeded, then that you have a potential to create yourself a, a forest fire. So when it's nice and green outside at night, it might be a good time to as well when it's not windy. Um, you just don't want those seeds to come out. So if you can catch them in the springtime before they start getting those little tiny flowers, do it right then. Pull them out before they even seed and do that every year, constant, don't stop. Um, that's why this is one of those active living, um, the, this is why the gardening is one of those active living things because you have to get out there, you have to move, you have to be proactive, you have to be able to get ahead of this. So get ahead of your, your weeds before they even start to seed. That's the only way you're gonna be able to beat this, any kinds of weeds, okay? Is that um the same weed that the one was talking about? That's the one I'm talking about. Um, I tried to um I have a lot of bullheads in my yard and around my home. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, bullheads are real pretty and nice and green in the springtime, and then come mid come mid um summer they start to dry out and they get hard, and that's where you get your bullheads. Um, so if you can just pull them out before it gets too bad. So before for myself, um, do you mind if I uh, say so? Go ahead, Dewan. So for myself, I've been pulling weeds since like the end of April, just because like it gets real annoying too, because we got like the uh, tumbleweeds, bullheads, and then like I said, the ton of studies. So the best time to get rid of them, I notice is as soon as it rains, I use like a little digging fork I just like soften up the soil and then pull the whole roots out and then I put it into one pile. Uh, it's difficult to burn once you pull it when it's still green, but you let it dry out probably like a week and they'll be able to burn easily. Yeah. So I mean, you you can let that you can do that, um, but when you're moving it, remember you're moving the seeds too as well, right? Yeah, I mean, like you try to get them before the little flowers start to yeah. bloom on them and. Like if you can get a container, it's best to like pick it up by your hand. It's a lot of work. Like my hands are completely busted right now. I've got so many bullheads that have broken to my hand, but it's a process. Like I've, I've learned that this whole past season, I didn't get to grow, but I've been trying to take care of my mother's land and the areas I'm thinking about growing at. So like you said, it's, it's a constant process. There's no, there's no breaks. Yeah. Yeah, like even our grandmas and grandpas would be out there in the field, like as soon as the sun came up, right? So they're out there, they're actively hoeing, they're actively moving things around, they're getting out there before the weeds get too big and take over the fields, right? This is why, um, this is why that we go back to that Navajo teaching of getting up with the sun, because you want to get those weeds before the hottest time of the day and you're not out there, you know, really working too hard. It's, it's the same teachings, it's just on a smaller scale, smaller garden level now. Hi, I, I've been raking, I'm sorry. I've been raking it and hoeing it all along and now it looks like grass in my in my yard now. <laughs> when so. you're raking- when <laughs> I don't you're know raking, if I should try burning. When you're raking it, you're actually moving those seeds around. When you're, when you're, um, yeah, when you're raking, it, you're moving those seeds around. So hand pulling them, probably the best way, the most m maximum, you know, efficient way to get rid of weeds, hand pulling them with the root. If you're talking about certain vining plants, these um, little tiny white, um, they're like vining plants. They call them, um, in, in Navajo, they call it, uh, I can't remember all of a sudden now. I can't remember the name. I can't remember now. But those ones, their roots can actually get to about 12 feet deep. And the tougher the root, 
the more they'll keep coming back. Sometimes they can propagate off of their roots and continue to grow from the root up. So it's best to take the whole root out. So hand pulling would be the most maximum efficient way. The next one would be hoeing. But if you're if you're if you're moving that plant around, it's already seeded around, then you've seeded your entire yard. This is Perrette. Can I add in a little bit about the bullheads? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I have a backyard and there was a lot of bullheads um, so much that like I wouldn't let my grandchildren go in my backyard. But one year, about three years ago, I started pulling them out and it, it is hard if it's better. Yes, before, when when they reach that little stage where they have those little purple flowers, I think it is it and right after it rains it's really easy to pull them, but of course sometimes um, some of the thorns get stuck into your hands, what I did is I got this little. Um, stainless steel tongs you know the kind that you use to like flip things over when you're cooking. It's not got the plastic on it, but you probably can use the plastic, um, the one with the plastic ends. But I use the stainless steel tongs there. They cost like $2 at the dollar store. And I use that to grab that by the root. And also if it didn't come out really easy, I use one of those little, um, I don't know what you call it, little gardening tools. They they look like they have two, um, two um prongs that are bent at the end you move your soil around with that one till you see your root and then you you can grab it either with your hand or with the tongs so maybe that'll help um uh, later on but this is two years later and those they they don't really come back once you get them out from the um from the ground with the root there's still a few out there but uh, you know, get them early in the season before they get hard and um, and it won't be so bad the next time that, you know, this is close by around my house too. So I hope that's helpful for people. Yeah. And you know what? Um, I have May here in the chat saying noxious weeds equal poor soil. Yeah, that is true. Um, your noxious weeds, you know, your, your good plants, they want really good soil to be able to grow into fruit. Your weeds will grow in just about anything and they're tough and they're they're rugged. And so they'll they'll take root in really poor soil. So working on your soil tilt will actually help you to get rid of those weeds faster and help you to pull those weeds out really well. Um, so it's gonna take a couple of years for you to do, but if you keep at it, you'll be able to get it done. All right, um, let's go ahead and move on to compost now. Uh, and then Clara, um, uh, let me get back to you on your amaranth and about amaranth. the Russian thistle. Do you have and any treatment? Russians, yeah, I, I, I'm not too sure. I need to do a little bit of research on those ones, um, but I'll let you know. Can you write that down for me? Clara asked the questions about the amaranth and Russian, Russian thistle. All right. Um, Okay, so now we're into compost. So soil naturally contains a small amount of organic matter. So adding compost every year increases the organic matter in your soil. Remember your organic matter has a lot of minerals and nutrients in it. When you add your compost, uh, your soil can absorb moisture better. It's gonna hold on to the moisture longer so you don't need to water as often. Um, and then compost provides habitat for beneficial soil microorganisms like your earthworms. And that helps to provide the nutrients to your plants, okay? And then soil with compost in it, it acts like a sponge so that nutrients stay in your garden instead of creating harmful runoff in nearby streams and lakes, okay? So compost is something we need to start learning about, um, especially if you're going to be doing um, container gardening, raised beds, those kinds of things, um, because we're going to be using those raised beds over and over every year. And so we're leaching out a lot of those nutrients. We want beneficial bugs in there so that we're not um, making that soil really compact. Okay, so when 
you're doing your harvesting right now, save your vegetable scraps, save your, um, save your leaves. Um, this is why I said fall is a really good time to start planning for springtime. Leaves, vegetable scraps, those are all ready to go compost things that you can do cold composting with. All right, next slide. Will adding um, a lot of compost help for clay soil? That's a question that we have. It really depends on your your type of clay. Some clays, um, they they some clays are too hard, and they they won't move around. Um, what you would do as far as clay, I I would really try to do raised bed on clay, just because of the the cost of of um, amending that soil. All right. And the time it's going to take to be able to amend the soil. If you want to grow like next month or next year, um, I, I would go with like a raised bed on top of your clay soil. Okay. But then you got to take into account that if you're growing on top of a clay soil, it's not going to be draining well um, because that water sits on top. Okay. So if you're doing raised bed and that water is not sitting on, it, it, that water is sitting on the bottom, um, it could uh overwater your plants and not have enough um leaching out but i would definitely recommend that or lasagna bed gardening too as well when you're doing lasagna bed gardening and you're adding your your um layers of lasagna for your beds uh you're planting on top of it then you can slowly start working it in and it'll take years to be able to have your clay soil turn into good soil okay and you might want to focus on a small area um me i like to do trial and error trial and error try 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 something small maybe like a four by four foot area um and then work your way work your way that way okay um but try try your yeah yeah i wouldn't work so i wouldn't work clay too much. I would definitely go with a raised bed in clay. Okay, uh, did that answer your question? All right. Um, okay, so making your own compost, it, making your own compost is definitely going to save your you money. It's something that we all need to think about. So saving money, I know it's a lot of work for us to be um, buying. Um, it's it's a lot of money for us to be buying all of these really expensive composts and fertilizers from the store. You know, they can go anywhere from eight to eight dollars a bag to like about fifteen dollars a bag, right? So it gets really costly, especially for the size of, of the garden that you need or that you want. Um, for your raised garden beds, you could be used to about four bags of two by two um, cubic uh, feet of garden soil just for one raised bed that's four by four, depending on how deep you want it If you, as far as the roots of, of the plants that you're planning on growing. So making your own compost is going to save your money and you can use your recyclable recyclables and put the nutrients back into your garden and into the ground it's going to keep your the cost of your trash down too as well um and there's going to be recipes in the course book for making your own compost okay so you'll be able to find that on page 42 and it's that little tiny table that says what to put in your compost pile um, they're going to be talking about brown layers and green layers. Okay, so brown layers are like your dry leaves, your straw, your sawdust, your torn paper bags, um, corn husk, shredded newspaper. And then your green layers are going to be your garden waste, your kitchen scraps, um, your coffee grounds, your grass clippings. You can even use um, wool from your sheeps. Um, and then your composted manure. So you got brown layers and green layers. 
You don't want to put like meat or dairy bones. Like you don't want to put diseased plants in there. You don't want to use um, compost. You don't want to make compost out of weeds. You know what I mean? Because remember I told you about all the seeds that are there. It takes a lot, a lot of time um, to be able to get rid of those seeds. You don't want those in there in, in your raised beds. Um, you don't want to use um, feces from uh, meat eating animals like dogs, cats, those kinds of things. You don't want that. Um, and then your fireplace ash, a little bit. Um, you don't want the plastic in it. If it's regular wood ash, yeah, a little bit. A couple of handfuls is all you really need um, because it'll it, it'll increase your pH balance. Okay, you only want to use wood ash if you need a good pH. You need to increase your pH balance a lot for say something like tomatoes or roses. Okay. A um, couple questions. Uh, first, C. Morris said, "Thank you for answering my questions." That was the clay question. Um, what does hot compost mean? And how about lemon peels? Are those okay? Hot composting is in the middle of summer when you're putting all your vegetable scraps in a pile, you would cover it with something like a dark material, like a dark plastic. You would wet it down real good, cover it with a dark plastic, and you would let it bake and cook all the way down um, until it turns into a nice uh compost that's what hot composting means cold composting is what i'm telling you to do this fall take your dead leaves put it in a pile in a place where it gets lots of rain or lots of water and let it compost on its own throughout the winter come springtime you turn it over it'll be ready to go and lemon pills they would be okay right because they're um a fruit i think lemon peels and orange peels are okay i am um i don't know maybe i have to ask that question maybe i'll look into lemon peels mm -hmm. because it is it's it, it's got some citric acid in it let me find that out um who asked that question let me go back um may okay may let me get back to you on the lemon peel one okay and then how about leaves, meaning leaves from our squash, beans, corn, or watermelon? Um, so from your corn, you got brown layers, right? So, so those are high in carbon, right? So that would go into your brown layers. And your leaves um, would go into your brown layers too as well. So use tree leaves. Um, use tree leaves um, that are not pine, okay? So um, certain types of oak tree, those cottonwood trees that you see out there, those leaves are pretty good, um, but don't use like pine needles. Um, so leaves from your squash, beans, corn, or watermelon, if you, as long as they don't have seeds and then you can break them down throughout the winter, they should be fine to, to go back into your compost coils. And just um, squash leaves without disease, right? If they have disease, don't put it in your compost. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they have to be good, healthy leaves. Um, we're gonna go over checking for diseases on your plants um, in one of the, I can't remember which one. I think it's um, lesson four. So we'll be going over um, finding diseases on your plants. Well, leaves don't have seeds on them. Um, it's the seeding that happens like in certain kinds of, what is that called? Weeds that we don't want in there. Um, but leaves, though, they don't have seeds in them. If you can cut down those leaves and, and get them really good into your compost pile, they should be fine. Okay. Next.
how to add finished compost to your garden. So you're going to add two to six inches of finished compost that you bought or that you made in your garden beds each year. There's a part, there's a chart on page 42 at the bottom. Okay, you can refer to that. Um, you want to mix or wiggle it in. You want to top dress your perennials yearly. Okay, so you don't want to get them into the roots, but you'll just top dress, which means you'll just put it around the base of your, your uh, plant where they come out in, in the wintertime. Um, so for perennial crops like your asparagus, your artichokes, your berries, you can drop, you can top dress those two inches of compost into the soil surface each year without mixing it in. So perennials are crops that are going to be alive for three or more years. Okay. Um, asparagus is one of those ones that once you get your asparagus going within the first, it doesn't fruit, it doesn't make asparagus for almost three years. And then after year three, it starts to create the asparagus. But once you have an, an asparagus bed, those asparagus will continue to come back year after year after year. And one asparagus plant can live up to 12 years and they'll keep coming back um, every year. So that's what a perennial crop is. Um, you can also build compost piles directly in your, in your beds. And this is what we're talking about right now, cold composting. Um, or sheet mulching, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, okay? Next slide. We're gonna talk about fertilizing now. Is there any other questions about fertilizing so far? I mean, uh, composting so far? Not in the chat. Okay. All right, next slide, please. Um, all right, fertilizing. Uh, fertilizing the garden, it's important to keep your plants healthy. Um, you can help your soil hold onto nutrients with good gardening practices. But vegetable gardens, they need extra nutrients every year. So giving the plants the right amount of nutrients at the right time is key to growing like the, your, your most successful vegetables. Um, so plants need 16 nutrients to thrive. The major three are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK, okay? Um, and those are found in most, in most fertilizer mixes and plants need them in larger amounts than other nutrients because they create fruit, okay? And plants need smaller amounts of the other 13 nutrients called micronutrients, okay? Um, what do the, number, the numbers mean? You're always gonna remember these three letters, N, P, K. N is nitrogen, P is phosphorus, K is potassium, okay? And they're always gonna be in that order, N, P, K. So when you're looking at the bag, you're going to see the number at the top and you'll see that they're, they have a complete fertilizer. So when we're talking about balanced fertilizer, the numbers are going to be 10, 10, 10. That's a balanced fertilizer. 15, 15, 15 is a balanced fertilizer. Okay. When you get your soil testing done, right? And let's say your phosphorus is too high, right? You wanna get something with a lower phosphorus. So your numbers are gonna be different, like the ones you see in this, in this photo right here, 15, five, and 10. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you really have to start to think about and learn about every year, okay? And then soil testing will help you to determine um, where you are. But the first three years, remember, we want to use a good balanced fertilizer. So for the first two or three years, use a balanced fertilizer, 10, 10, 10, 15, 15, 15. Those I would recommend for the first three years. Then after you've gotten the hang of learning about your soil and where it needs to be and the nutrients that it needs, 
then you can go back into using the ones with the higher nitrogen. Um, let's say you've been growing, let's say you've been growing pumpkins um, in one of your raised beds and it leached a lot of the nitrogen out, right? Um, and you need more nitrogen than you need phosphorus or potassium, right? There's different ways you can fertilize too, okay? And sometimes crop rotation will help you with this, okay? So beans are a good thing, a, a, a good plant to plant in something that was heavily um, leached from nutrients the year before. Okay, so if you're doing pumpkins in that patch, maybe the next year you want to put beans in there because beans, they put more nitrogen back into that soil and it helps that soil to recover a little bit better so that you're not buying the fertilizer as much. Okay. So okay. ask the question, do we test the soil each year? You don't have to test it each year. I would recommend you do the first year, the third year, and the fifth year. But if you want to, by all means, go ahead. It's it's a, a learning process. The science is something, if that science is something that you want to get down, go ahead and, and do it every year. Okay, so we all understand we want to use a nice balanced soil for at least the first two to three years. And that's going to be 10, 10, 10, 15, 15, 15. All nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, you want to apply fertilizer in your first year of your new garden. You want to fertilize it in the spring, about a month before you sow before you sow seeds or you transplant. Um, you can also do it around about the time when you're cutting down your cover crops. You want to put your cut down your cover crops, put your fertilizer in, and turn it over. Um, so you can do it that way too as well. It's going to give your soil the good the microorganism microorganisms it needs to, um, time to break down the fertilizer and into the form that the plants need and can use. Okay, after a season or two, you're going to be able to fertilize at plants of time without waiting. Okay, for in the whole applications, fertilize when you transplant your starts. Okay. Um, and then when you're applying your chemical fertilizer, if you choose to use a chemical fertilizer, you want to follow the directions on the package. Okay. Um, it all, when I don't really like to use chemical fertilizers because um, I'm always afraid that it's just going to leach out too fast. Um, and then with the organic fertilizers, it's something that I can see. It's something that I'm familiar with. It's really all up to you and what your preference is. Okay, any questions on when to apply your fertilizers? So the first year, fertilize in the spring about a month before you sow your seeds or transplant. And then you can go mid-year and you can do maybe like a lip, uh, maybe a chemical for fertilizer, maybe even like a fish fertilizer. Those work really well. Next. Um, so even though you mixed in like a slow releasing fertilizer at planting time, remember that nutrients are often flushed out with watering. So you might need to use a liquid fertilizer like every two to three weeks to keep planting and growing their best, okay? So follow the recommendations for the product that you choose. Um, just read the bag, read the label. Um, they have like vegetable, they have like vegetable, what are they called, plant food? Like miracle Grow. Um, that you can use too as well. That works wonders. Um, and then like fish, fish fertilizer that works well too as well. Just a little bit here and there, but follow the follow the directions. Next, oh fertilizing. Okay, thank you. Um, so plants they're gonna need nitrogen for healthy growth. You know, nitrogen is is the one that leaches out of your soil the most. So as we're as we talk about, um. In, in chapter three in next week, um, we can do a side dress of a small amount of quick release nitrogen fertilizer like fish emulsion 
and then you can water your plants. Um, you don't want to apply extra nitrogen to like peas, tomatoes, or squash because it can make the plants produce only leaves and no fruit. Okay, if you notice a pale green or yellow and slow growth about four to five weeks after planting, your crops may need more nitrogen. Um, we do have a master gardener hotline and you'll be able to find it in your seed, your seed to supper workbook on page 155, let me double check. Between 155 and 161, you'll be able to see um, additional places where you can get gardening information. And that's all within your appendix. Uh, and then on appendix 163, um, you'll see um, there's a whole section on tomatoes, okay? Depending on your tomato variety, they're very finicky as far as your pay, the, the pH balances and then also their nutrient balances. So there's entire, there's entire places where you can go to just research tomatoes, okay? Um, but you can find a Master Gardener hotline and, and those resources in the appendixes. Next slide, please. Um, for your containers, you wanna add fertilizer every two weeks. Um, so the types of fertilizers you can use are the, the, the complete fertilizers containing the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, your worm, your worm casting tea, and dilated and di, a little bit of diluted fish fertilizer. Okay. Next slide. Making your garden beds. All right. Um, a raised bed is any garden bed that's raised above the natural ground level. Okay, you see in this picture, there is no wood um, holding that up. Um, it's a little bit higher than the rest of the ground. That's a raised garden bed. Um, so anything that's raised above the natural surface of the soil is a raised garden bed. Next slide. So there's plenty of really good reasons for raised garden beds. You can plant vegetables throughout your yard, um, but raised garden beds help you um, help you to avoid stepping on your garden soil. It helps you to focus on the areas where your plants will be growing, um, and then you'll be able to save on fertilizer and compost, so you know the locations that you need to grow, um, and you're not wasting your time on. <laughs> on your walkways, you know? Um, and then raised garden beds will warm up sooner in the spring and you, that means that you can plant just a little bit earlier. So um, it, it helps you to avoid stepping on your garden soil. It helps you to um, focus your efforts and your labor on that one section of the raised bed and then it warms up sooner. Next slide. So beds are usually um, three to four feet wide. Um, you wanna be able to work it from both sides in the middle, okay? Um, as long as your space allows, you wanna have them up to about three to four feet wide. You wanna build your beds so that you can easily reach from the, from, from the sides into the middle on both sides. All right, and then um, they might ask, what do they mean when they ask what zone, zone are you in? Um, what does it mean when we ask what zone we're in? Who's asking the question? D Mike. D Mike. Okay, when we're talking about the zones we are in, we're going to go back over to chapter one of the Seed to Supper manual. Okay, when we talked about the zones that we're in, which zone, where, where is he located at? Mm -hmm. 
the zones are just your your elevation um right here in our area in winter rock area where i'm based out of our zone is zone eight or zone one anything above six thousand feet anything between four thousand to six thousand feet is zone two Anything from 3,500 to 5,000 feet is a zone three. And then all your lower levels, those that are in Phoenix, those that are in um, Tucson, those are like zone four, four, five, and six. Here in Wind Rock, we're at zone one because we're about six, we're over 6,000 feet. We're actually way over that. Um, but then we do have microclimate. So you want to keep, you want to keep that in mind too as well because Winter Rock's right in the middle of a valley between two mountain ranges, a plateau and then the uh, um mountains too as well. Uh, my question we have is, is it okay to add nitrogen to your soil before you plant if you already know that you have that problem? Yes, you can actually um, go ahead and start um, putting in your your green matter, your green layers. So your green layers, your garden waste, your kitchen scraps, your grass clippings, your pet hair, and your composted manure. Those are the ones that you want to put in your garden. Did that answer her question? Um, I'm not sure. She just said that um, she was having problems for the past few two years. My corn and squash didn't grow very well. The leaves got yellow after it started growing and hardly got any corn or squash. And if I did, it would be small. They didn't get any bigger. Yeah, you 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 might want to put more nitrogen in there or get the, you know, you might want to give your, your corn a break and put some beans in. Um, plant beans next year where you would put your corn and let that nitrogen, uh, those beans, put that nitrogen back into your soil and start to build it up again. Sometimes you just need to do a crop rotation so that you're building your soil back up. Because corn and squash, those those will really leach your your nutrients. That'll really need to use a lot of your nitrogen. Okay. Yeah. Forest Lake and Pinon area. So he's in Forest Lake and Pinon area. Let me check his zones real quick. What was his name again? B Mike. B Mike. So he's at about zone two between 4,000 to 6,000 feet. Yes. Yeah. All right, let's see. Oh, okay, if you have more than one bar garden bed, you want to separate you want to separate to separate your beds with pathways, okay? When you're making your garden, when you're planning out your garden, you want that walkway space. You want to be able to fit your wheelbarrow through it. You want to be able to walk through it. If you're going to be doing vining plants in them, make sure that you're putting them in an area where they have room to grow out and over. Um and those vining plants like your squash, your melons, your pumpkins, they can take over your walkways. Okay, so if you have more than one bed, try to separate the beds uh, to where you can walk through with the pathways. Um, you're gonna need at least 18 inches for a footpath and 24 to 36 inches for using like wheelbarrows and garden carts, okay? Which manure did you say is best to use? So anything, oh, <sighs> the manure of four stomached animals. So sheep is an abundance around here. That would be a good manure to use. Remember, over 120 days old and let it compost for quite some time. You don't want to take it straight out of the corral and into your garden. If you're going to take it straight out of the corral and into your garden, make sure you're doing it when you're not ready to plant. Do it in the in the fall time so it has time to break down and, and um, really become a compost for that soil, okay? Um, you can use sheep, you can use cow. Cow is what you would buy at the stores. That's what they sell the most at the stores in the bags. Um, rabbits are good and chickens are good. Next. So do you need retaining walls? 
Um, there's really good, there's some pros and cons to retaining walls. So the pros are it, it, you can create special shapes, you can grow upwards, you can use narrower walkways, and it's accessible for people with limited mobility that can't, um, you know, bend down, uh, stand up. Um, the cons are is you're going to be buying material to make those retaining walls. Okay, so lumber is very expensive. Um, and then also, if you're going to be using uh, stone for those, um, you got to remember that stone, it absorbs heat, right? So if you're living in an area where it gets really hot, you don't want something, you don't want to use a material that's going to absorb too much heat and bake your, your um, roots. But if you're living like in a colder area, like um, Luca, uh, Sawmill, uh, crystal, you might want to use those if you want to start planting a little bit earlier and you need your soil to warm up a little earlier. So even the material that you, you, you use to build your retaining wall is going to cost something. It is going to, um, it is going to take a lot of work to be able to get it done. And remember that you're going to be trying to fill it to the top all the way. Um, so it can get really expensive and very labor intensive. Okay, and another con about it is they create hiding spaces for um, different kinds of pests, okay? Um, things can crawl in and live down among what you put down there and and it just, it just can take off from there. Um, even termites, those kinds of things can start to, to grow in, in retaining walls. But if you're choosing to build your retaining walls, use you want to use blocks, stone, or boards. You don't want to use railroad ties because railroad ties, um, any kind of treated wood or any kind of wood with paint on it, because you don't know what was in the paint. You don't know what kind of chemicals they use to keep it from rotting, and that will leach into your soil. Um, other things I would tell you to stay away from is don't grow your vegetable plants and tires, okay? It's not good for you. They have chemicals in them that could be harmful to you that can cause cancers. Can um, you plant corn and squash in a bed? Yes, you can plant corn and squash in a bed. We do that here on the Navajo Nation Fairgrounds. Um, we do our corn and squash in raised beds because we do have a clay soil here. Um, and then we don't want it, we didn't want to dig down um, especially because it floods in that area. So we built upwards. Um, and so we grow our corn and our squash in those beds. Um, and we can fit, we can fit about five squash plants into one bed. Um, this year, we're going to be adding compost to it. We're going to be adding a lot of good nutrients into it uh, because we've used that one bed for two years for pumpkins and squash. Um, I think that's, yeah, I think that's about it with that one. Uh, we might want to, we might want to think about rotating, uh, do a crop rotation on ours too as well. Um, but we did some soil amending in the springtime and now we have to re-amend it again because it's not giving the right uh, nutrients. So we'll be doing a lot more adding a lot more compost to it this year, probably about three to four inches this year. Any other questions? Yeah. I've got a question. So we're talking about raised beds. Would uh, adding wood chips and small pebbles or like river rocks into it help with the air pockets or the airflow? Um, depending on how deep your your raised beds are. I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend using <laughs> river rocks at the bottom yeah, just because uh, then all of your water starts to sit in there, right? Um, and yeah. when we're talking about container gardening, we talk about putting rocks at the bottom. I know a lot of people want to put rocks at the bottom because it fills that space between the bottom and the top, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was talking about that, I believe, like in the beginning of the chapter. Uh -huh. So I'm, I was just wondering, just like a couple here and there, I'm 
just to allow airflow through it on the first first chapter, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think that a couple of them will be okay, maybe a light layer. Um, like if you have pests like prairie dogs, maybe a layer of sandstone at the bottom might be okay to keep those pests out and then build your way up from there. Um, but I wouldn't do like a thick, thick layer of it. Oh, okay. Okay. But wood okay, chips so, would be good as well though. I'm sorry, what? How about wood chips? Depending on what kind of wood chips you want to use, you don't want to use pine because it's very acidic. So not pine, okay. Yeah, yeah if you're um, going to use wood chips from your wood pile, you got to make sure that you decompose, let it decompose a little bit before you put it into your garden. If you're going to use wood chips, you want to use it in the walkways. What your wood chips right. do is act like a mulch, and that mulch will keep your, your, your walkways um, from overgrowing all the weeds and stuff. And it'll make your weeds even easier to pull out and it'll keep the moisture in your in the ground right there. But as far as using wood chips directly into your raised beds, the only way I can see that happening is if you're um, picking the right kind of wood chip, okay? Oak wood chips, depending on certain types of oaks, they can have a higher pH balance and it can throw off your soil. Um, and then pine wood too, as well, is like, don't even use that. Don't even use pine needles that's, too, that's got too much acid in it um, and, and it'll kill your plants. So be careful with your wood chips and try to only use them in, in between uh, your walkways or if they're older than a year or so. Okay. Okay, make sure you're breaking them down really, really good. You've got a few questions in the chat. The first one is from May. Are you going to invite us when you are going to plant? <laughs> if you want to, I wouldn't mind doing another. We did have in-person seat to supper class this year. We did try it out. Um, it wasn't very popular. I'm hoping that while doing these um, online events and teaching these classes, I find a, a, a good population base where I can just send an email to everybody and let you guys know that you can come and help me out over here because I am more than willing to have you guys come out and do some work for me. It'd be so much help. But yeah, that's something we can do. We can plan that with either Navajo Nation Library or the Special Diabetes Program and put on an event where you can do in-person gardening. Um, Alma, who is from the Navajo Nation Library, she attended our in-person Seed to Supper event. Um, Alma, can you kind of explain to them what we did? Well, first of all, I didn't know anything about gardening, but, um, and I was the one who explained everything, and it was so interesting that I didn't even know you would have to balance out your soil and the um, raised beds and even the beds. So um, I was confounded that every, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into gardening. And um, I learned a lot that day. Um, it was fun, we weren't in the office, <laughs> we were outside. <laughs> so, but um, we did a lot of stuff and we um, tested the soil, we, um, watered the soil to where it was um, really moist. And I didn't know that the, the moisture of when you're gonna plant before you plant is really, um, I would say wet. Uh -huh. Like so overwatered? I, yeah, yeah, like overwatered. I didn't know that um, you do that before planting. So um, that was a fun day for me. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of seeding. We learned about plant families that day. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, in our second class, we did um, soil testing. We did um, more planting too as well. Mm -hmm. So the first, the first class, we just went over um, prepping and getting everything cleaned up and ready to go. The second class, we did soil testing, soil amending, and we did some, um, we did some um, planting that day. And then throughout the summer, we just continued to plant. Um, if you were at the Navajo Nation Fair, a lot of the kids got to eat the vegetables straight from the garden. So they got to pick their own carrots that we planted. Mm -hmm. They got to pick a lot of their own radishes and turnips and even tomatoes out of the garden. And so they just washed them right there in the garden and got to be able to eat them. Anybody else? 
Um, if you do plant squash, do you do it in the middle of the bed or on the side and how much um, space should they be apart? You're always gonna want to plan for your footing. So make sure you're checking your common crop chart, okay? So depending on your variety, if it's a summer squash or a winter squash, winter squash are gonna vine out. And sometimes winter squash can get up to 12 feet, six feet to 12 feet. Um, and that's just a square. So you're gonna wanna think about how far to put it away from the next squash, or you can stagger them inside your, your beds so that they have that wiggle room and that space, okay? And then for your summer squash, um, they can grow up to about six feet and they can grow up to about hip high. Okay, so plan out for that footing, plan out for that space. Refer back to this chapter one and check your common crop chart and check your seed packets um, to know where you want to do to space it apart. And then we also talked about double seeding, right? Because we do have pests and we do have problems um, with getting things started. And sometimes plants just don't take. So if we double seed, um, you'll be able to pick the strongest plant as they grow and then weed out the, you can pick out the ones that are not gonna do good, okay? Did that answer your question? And then there's another question. Um, dogs tend to pee all over. Does that do damage the garden plants? Mm. Uric acid is an acid. Urine is, is acidic. Um, it's not hygienic to have your animals in your garden. Um, so I would recommend you not bring the dogs into the garden because they can act like a pest and they can eat your vegetables. If your dogs are, are missing vitamins and minerals in their, in their diet, they, they can eat your, your, your plants. So try to keep your, your dogs out of your garden as much as possible because dogs do have diseases and they have worms and those kinds of things. If they're pooping and peeing in your garden, you have the potential to contaminate your, your food. So try to keep your, your animals, if they, if they don't know where they need to go to go to the bathroom, um, you could be, you know, anything that's foreign to a garden that you wouldn't eat, like you don't want it in there. And then can you use mulch to kill the bullheads in the yard? Um, yeah, you can. It, when you're when you're putting the mulch down, it just gives the uh, it gives that ground um, in between your walkways and stuff. Uh, um, not enough light to the ground so that your weeds can come out, and then it just kind of lightens up the soil and keeps it wet underneath, which makes it easier for you to pull the weeds out. So yeah, mulch in between your garden beds will work just just as well. And May just had a follow-up um, comment. She was saying these are community dogs. So any suggestions for that? Fencing. Fencing is the only way you can take those, take care of those community dogs. <clears throat> okay, time is 7.31. Um, I'm hoping that everybody got their, um, Questions answered this evening. No more questions on Facebook Live. You can ask me if he has any questions. All right, um, next week we're gonna be going over chapter three. Remember, if you come back for next week's class, you can get um, you can get the hard copy of the book, which looks like this. It's a really nice book. It's got, it's wire bound too as well. Um, so if you are here for the third class, I will leave a box of these um, Seeds of Supper manuals at the Navajo Nation Library. So whenever you're in Windrock, you can drop by the library and Alma will have a list of your names and she can check you off. You can pick it up and take it home. Um, this, this way you have the hard copy and you don't have to go back and forth to um, the online manual, the, the, the digital manual. Um, and we will 
probably be having this class again, again this coming winter again. Um, so we'll probably be doing that through Navajo Nation Library one more time. So if you want, if you missed something, if you want to try again and you want to qualify to get this manual and you want to do this class again, and uh, if you miss a couple of classes, you can always re-register and take the class again. If you want to read ahead, go on ahead and read ahead. If you you can have your questions ready for me to answer. Um, but yeah, next one, we're going to be talking about planting with your containers. You're, we're going to be talking about your seeds and your transplants. We're going to be talking about direct seeding and your transplanting. To understand that tomatoes have a whole different way of being transplanted as compared to other plants. Um, and then when we were talking about fertilizing too as well, we're, we're talking about getting that, um, that what do they call it? The, the, the fertilizer, the, the liquid fertilizer and using that during transplanting time. So um, go ahead and, and read on forward and have your questions ready. If you have a question from here until later on, um, go, go ahead and feel free to email me. Those of you that have my email and are registered, um, so you can shoot me those questions. Can you give me the questions? As for the questions for Clara on the Emirates and the Russian thistle, and who, and then May, you wanted to talk about lemon peels and your compost tool as well. Um, I will get back to you and we'll talk about it in the next class. Is that okay? Oh, D. Mike says he did not register. How can he register? Um, I did close registration for the this event for this class, so he can wait until the next winter, the winter class, okay. and then he can register register for the winter class. Okay. So, we'll we can get that done. All right. I'm gonna. With that said, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna end the class. Time is now seven thirty five. I'm I'm really happy to have you guys all here. Thank you so much for registering and keeping up with everything. If you have auto, um, sleep well tonight. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your evening. Thanks, Santa Rita. Talk to you later. Bye, everybody. Go net. Thank you. Oh. Lisa, you can go ahead and uh, end the class now. Is okay, class sounds good. Thanks, great job. Have a great day, you guys. Good night. See you next Thursday.